Well, welcome to Giza Direct with Hugh Newman, Andrew Collins, and Patricia Iwan. Let's begin with introductions. Uh, Hugh, what is your background and interest in the sites of Egypt? Sure, yeah, uh, my name's Hugh Newman. I'm a megalithic researcher. Um, I've been uh, coming to Egypt since 2010. The first time I came here was with Robert Duval. And um, yeah, I've been organizing conferences and tours specifically at megalithic kind of areas around the planet and uh, that's really my main area of focus. I've also been researching the giant skeletons that have been found in North America and around the world. I have quite a deep interest in uh, earth energies and geomancy and things such as geodesy and the relationship between ancient sites around the planet. Excellent. Andrew? Hi, uh, yeah, my name's Andrew Collins. Uh, I've been investigating the mysteries of ancient Egypt since uh, uh, 1981, uh, in particularly, because that was the first time I actually came here. Um, and uh, my main area of interest is probably the cosmology um, and the ideas that the ancient Egyptians had relating to, you know, the death journey uh, and where they actually saw the place of the afterlife. And, looking for evidence of that and also trying to understand the origins of the ancient Egyptians where their ideas of technology and cosmology came from, the fact that they may well have uh, been originally in South East Turkey at Quebec to Tepe going back uh, 11,500 years uh, and taking it back even further perhaps to one of the distant cousins of humanity who we now know as the Denisovans um, who existed down through till around 40,000 uh, years ago and may well have gifted civilization to us modern humans at this time. Excellent. Patricia? And I'm Patricia Hawian Lehman and I've uh, been living here for 10 years and very excited to be hosting both of these gentlemen on a recent tour of Egypt. Uh, really exciting tour uh, with Andrew having not been here for the you and I shared a tour in October that was quite exciting with Hassim Harriman. But uh, this tour was quite interesting. We had Brian Forrester and Yosef along with us, Yosef uh, Alian. And uh, I think among the five of us, we, we, we kind of stick, stuck together and then ran off in different directions, finding all kinds of interesting new anomalies. And uh, we're all looking at different things within our research and yet combining and sitting down and comparing notes. And uh, I think it's amazing how we connect the dots as we go and with the, um, the, the amazing different fields of expertise that our, our guests have that uh, join the conversation and um, enhance all of our, you know, everyone's knowledge as we go. Um, so with that in, 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 in mind, I think Andrew began, uh, I think, with our first lecture in uh, on the boat in... Um, where were we? Traveling between Traveling Luxor between and, and Komopo. Uh, he did an, an amazing, brilliant lecture about some of his recent research. Um, I think I would like to get started there. Cool. Uh, well, um, the Giza Plateau obviously is probably where we should start. Uh, as it's right behind us now. Um, but I've been very interested in the alignments uh, at Giza and to try and understand whether there was some kind of grand design within the actual um, creation of the plateau in the first place in the Giza pyramid field uh, at the time of, of King Khufu uh, during the fourth dynasty of the old kingdom around 2600 BC um, and I've been working with an engineer by the name of Rodney Hale uh, and essentially what we've realised is that there is uh, a very basic, simple geometry associated with the design of the plateau that all stems out from a single point uh, to the south of the Sphinx called Jebel Ghibli, which is um, sometimes known as the False Pyramid because it's so prominent uh, when you're at the plateau itself. This, we suspect, was the original survey point and from this outwards, a very basic geometry was created using the 345 uh, right angled triangle, or otherwise known as the Pythagorean triangle. We think this was chosen very specifically to do with sound acoustics, musical intervals, 
uh, whether it be on a symbolic level or actual work, I'm sure. But tied in with this um, is an astronomical ground plan as well, uh, which uh, from my own research seems to be focused on the constellation of Cygnus in the northern part of the sky, which according to the pyramid texts is where the soul journeys in death. Uh, there is a path that leads from west to east within the sarcophagus chamber. Um, but then, very specifically, the pyramid texts, which are in later pyramids that come after those at Giza, around 100 years later, it talks about the soul being projected almost like through a gun barrel, through the end, what we call the entrance towards the northern part of the sky. Well, where does it go? Well, all the indications are that the constellation of Cygnus uh, was the womb, the cosmic womb of the sky goddess or representative of the Milky Way by the name of Nuit. Um, and she is the mother of Osiris, the mother of Re, um, to which the Pharaoh is equated in death. So that's essentially what we find at Giza, and it seems to be there in many other tombs and pyramids uh, you know, throughout Egypt. But what's important is that you have exactly the same ideas of the journey of the soul in death at Gebekli Tepe. That too, its various stone enclosures are also aligned towards the north, towards Cygnus. Uh, and when you start looking around the world, you find this everywhere. Um, in North America, in India, in Hawaii, various other places around the world. Uh, and it's quite clear that there's some kind of very ancient cosmic origin here. And that uh, if you look at it all the way back. Hold still. <laughs> the challenges of filming in Cairo. <laughs> <laughs> Roll credits. <laughs> around the world we find that uh, there are many many sites uh, that also seem to feature the same area of sky and the same associations of the soul's journey from a cosmic source and its return uh, and it's my belief that we can trace this all the way back to the very origins of uh, humanity's place in this world at least back to 40 45,000 years ago uh, and I'm looking now at the idea that a lot of these ideas came from these distant cousins of humanity known as the Denisovans or the Denisovans, um, who we now know existed probably from about two to three hundred thousand years ago down to around 40,000 years ago. And they're an incredibly fascinating population that we're only now beginning to understand. Uh, they had uh, beautiful jewellery, they may well have ridden horses, they, they had tailored clothing. They were the most sophisticated, most um, advanced peoples on this planet prior to our own spread throughout the Eurasian continent and into the Americas. So that, that's where I'm at at this time. And I want to try and embrace some of these ideas you know, during tours like this, not just also telling you know, the tour guests uh, about this research, which I'm obviously very excited about, but also to try and confirm these, also to talk to people. I mean, on this tour we've got, you know, we've got artists, we've got geneticists, uh, people from all walks of life who have listened and added and enriched the ideas that I'm already working on. I feel real confident that we're on the right track here. And that's important to tours like this. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. You. <laughs> and you, you did a fabulous presentation about Earth grid lines and uh, so many 
So many different things. I'd also like to hear about your research into agriculture and seeding, paramagnetic rocks, um, and also what you're looking at here in, in, in Egypt. Well, uh, yeah, one of the things I discussed in the lecture, which I've been uh, researching for some time, is, uh, you know, I've been really interested in earth energies, just this idea of, you know, natural earth energies, also ley lines, which are kind of separate things but connected. Um, I came through it from a strange place through crop circles and all things, but that's actually where this, this researcher, this scientist called John Burke, who was part of the BLT research team in Boston, was also a crop circle researcher, but from a much more scientific perspective. And he came up with this brilliant uh, principle that they found all around the world, where the ancients were harnessing natural earth energies into their sacred and ancient sites. And if you place your seeds in them, you would get enhanced uh, quality of seeds, crops and growth, uh, and strength, and things like this. So it's an agricultural sort of invisible technology. Also, the same energy would affect consciousness, and this is something that's been recorded, obviously, all around the world. It's something that Andrew's uh, looked at in some of his early work as well. And um, But in relationship to Egypt, it seems like there's such a um, vast megalithic civilization here, and the type of stones they were working with, the crystalline granite, the 55% quartz, uh, the different basalts, the limestones, all act you know, different qualities. Uh, not just of um, you know of the type of stone they are, but uh, the energetic qualities and their potentials they can they can, they can you know come from them like uh, acoustics, the geometry, the way they're placed together, um, a piezoelectric effect. Some acting as conductors, some acting as insulators. And there's this whole principle and brilliant idea that Chris Dunn's put together about the Giza Palpine, where he encompasses all of this into one system inside the Great Pyramid, which is right there. Um, and so we know, you know, that the, the ancients had a higher understanding of that. And to them, it was there, you know, the same way we class high technology in our world with computers, uh, you know, and uh, you know, technology and, so, and all the different things we, we have in this this era. They had it then, but it was, it was working with the natural, you know, the natural substances, the rocks, uh, the underground water, the, even in the whole area of Giza going down the whole line of pyramids. It's all a seismic zone as well, so they were harnessing um, that kind of energy from the earth. So there's, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on, and this, I think, this is probably one of the key areas where they were working with that. It's actually what John Michelle called it, the enchantment of the landscape, where these sites weren't just built as, you know, multi-purpose tombs, repositories of knowledge, um, you know functional temples and things like this, but they would actually like to enchant the landscape and all the humans and animals and wildlife within it. going to be quite an amusing thing if you put this out. <laughs> I think you can leave that. Oh, the editing room is. will be fascinating. Uh, yeah. uh, anyway, con continue. No, I'm done. That's uh, it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did we just say the last bit yeah. or something? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll just throw some steps back there. Um, well, Little geomancy. Well, yeah. So the, the whole idea that, um, that, that these pyramids and other sites in Egypt were not just repositories of knowledge, temples, or sacred places. They were actually... Um, to enchant the landscape, which is what you know, John Michel put forward as a whole kind of idea and principle back in the 1970s and 80s, some of his classic works. And so, that, and I think this is like people who are aware, becoming more aware of this now. Although most of the stones have been stripped and all the sites have been damaged, there's still an element of this within within the landscape, within the energetic landscape of Egypt and other places. Well, also with the feeling of layers, it's layer upon layer upon layer of um, occupation here. And as you go back and you go down through the layers, you're looking at different kinds of rock being used. And then you look at the formulas. Why did they use basalt, the really dark, you know, the really ancient, dark, huge megalithic stones? That's the bottom layer. And then as you work your way up, you move into the granites and the limestones. And you look at, at just the formulas of some of these structures, energy devices, the layout, um, how each temple is laid out with alignments, um, to more than one, you know, mm -hmm. angle of, of, of the sun or the moon or the stars. 
um, and this is throughout Egypt, and you look at the angles of even all the temple structures, and then you're looking at the temples below the temples. Why did they build another structure on another one? Karnak, for instance, if you go below, you know, the, the uh, structure that we see today with the ram-headed sphinxes, uh, Age of Aries, you're looking at a temple that was dedicated to the bull, Age of Taurus, but it's moved just an angle because we precessed you know, just this much. So there's so many different formulas to look at, which also has, uh, a, it's a formula not only for what we're talking about, but also it, it, the design itself speaks to many different things symbolically. It has a lot to do with what Andrew's talking about, because we're looking, you know, sickness has, does have a huge role to play, but so does Orion, and you're looking at two sides at the same time. Both are reflected here. It tells a story uh, through structure that's really mirroring the stars in so many different ways. There's so many different ways to look at it, and I do believe it takes bringing so many different people from so many different schools of expertise, bringing those eyes all together to actually piece this story together. And I think that's part of what we're trying to do here, too. Anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> um, what were your thoughts of the Serapium? Have, have you ever been there before, Andrew? Uh, yes, I've been to Serapium before. Uh, it was many years ago, and um, I mean, I, I do tend to look at things more conventionally than, than some of my colleagues. Uh, so, you know, I was happy to accept that balls may well have been uh, buried in them at some point, and their mummies removed and uh, no trace of them today. But when you actually go in there, you start to realise that it's that's not it's not as easy as that. Um, the Apis Ball was very much associated with the stars. I mean, the, the actual creature itself was chosen due to its special markings. They actually looked for the special markings, when it included a star uh, on its forehead. Um, so there was obviously a connection with the stars right from the word go. But when you get into the Serapion, you can actually sense that. And, uh, and it was the thing that triggered it for me was looking at one of those incredibly massive sarcophagi uh, with its um, you know its roof just slightly displaced and it had this incredible vein of quartz that split in two and if you took that image and showed it to anybody and said what is that they'd say that's the Milky Way where it's where it splits in two in the area of the signal constellation uh, it's known as the, it's called by the dark rift and these twin branches of the Milky Way was seen all the way around the world as the point of entry into the sky world. Um, they were often seen as like a bridge um, and one of the routes went uh, to the afterlife, the other one, if you were bad, would lead to oblivion and this is a universal thing, it's there within Native American tradition, it's there in Islamic tradition for instance, it's, it's there in various other parts of the world. and. Um, so when I saw that, it sort of it did something to me, I think, it, and it made me realise that there was a relationship here of the passage of the soul through the underworld, the duat, and the achievement of ascension amongst the stars itself. Uh, and I'd not felt that before, probably because you know a lot of my research is, is developing across the years. So there's a much deeper implication, and also the great work that, that Yusuf has done on trying to understand how they polished those incredible sarcophagi, um, the fact that there may have even been some kind of alchemical process involved. Uh, I, I didn't really understand it until he pointed it out and I think he's onto something. So, you know, yeah, that's expanded my mind going there yesterday. It's an incredible place. You? Well, uh, well the Serapium is like one of those places where uh, from a megalithic perspective, it's like, um, like a diamond in the rough. It's like incredibly high technology, which is obviously something that several people have noted. Chris Dunn, in particular, he's like a sort of professional engineer. Um, the stuff Yusef, Yusef was pointing out was remarkable because it, like, it looks like, I mean, he was pointing out what looked like drips of rock coming off one of the lids of the sarcophagi. Now, when he showed me that, I, I, I had a brain melt. I just couldn't quite grasp the, the concept but it's been I've been dwelling on it since but the, if that's the case then there is something to be said about like the melting and, and manipulation of stone probably using acoustics and other, and other such things 
uh, that that could be a reality. I mean, when you look at other places, I mean, look all over Saqqara, if you look hard enough, you see huge megalithic blocks, like this, certain pyramids, um, and you know, and Giza as well. And you have to question how on earth could they move these? I think when we, yeah, the ones in the Osiris shaft, the sarcophagi there, extremely large, extremely sophisticated, and um, I think there's a big question mark. I mean, one, one of the theories that has been going around about the sarcophagi in the Serapium is that giant humans were buried in them. Now, there's no evidence of this. There's been people putting stuff out online about this, and, and I've questioned this. There's that one account, as Andrew suggested, of this sort of these bones of an ape, a baby apis bull that were found either in the sarcophagus or in one of the passageways. Hence, it became known as uh, an apis bull burial place. But I think there's more to it than that. There's something very strange going on there. And I think uh, I was talking to Patricia back in October about this when we were in there and about uh, this idea that it was actually a repository or a, a place where they would store seeds and grains. Because, you know, there's something about the. You wouldn't make them these so precise, with so much trouble to transport them so far away for just putting, you know, apis bull skeletons in. There's got to be some purpose, and like technology, to, to like to have a purpose there. And I think uh, Patricia's idea of a seed bank might, there might be there might be some reality in that. Well, that's some, one of the things I've been researching is ancient seed technologies and paramagnetism and electromagnetic grid lines. And when you look at where it's located and some of the mythologies about what was done here with seeds. Um, and some of, of, even again, the structures and the layouts of some of these uh, sites that we go to, uh, some of the devices we're finding that certainly appear to be, um, have might have been used for seed technologies. But when you look at the structure of the Serapium itself, to me, uh, boy, it's the biggest smoking gun on the planet. People see it in pictures, but until they walk down, you know, down the steps and into these tunnels that, you know, are, <laughs> You have these hallways flanked with these huge boxes, with 60 ton boxes with maybe 20 to 30 ton lids. And these boxes are just absolute, I mean, consider this, these lids on top of these huge boxes would have been sealed totally, completely, that oceans of water could, you know, flood the area and whatever is inside would be completely sealed. And today, when we look at the future and people speak about possible catastrophes, uh, the, what, what do we find all over the world but these seed banks? And if you look at the design, it's quite similar. Uh, other things within the structure point to, you know, when they take the lids off, and we saw this in the uh, Egyptian Museum, we saw a box that's half, you know, it, 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 they, it's half completed, they stopped. And we see how it was created, but what I want to point out is we can see that they took the, the lid, they cut the lid off the bottom of the box, turned it over and put it on top, so you're reversing the charge. And I believe they created these, you can put seeds, you can put DNA, you can put seedlings of every tree on the planet. Are we looking at a huge Noah's Ark? You know, it makes, to me it makes a lot of sense. And then when you look at, you know, they tell us that the Tomb Raiders came and they, you know, chopped away at these things and did, you know, pickaxes or whatever, even, you know, gunpowder or whatever to get into these these structures and these boxes, you know, to look looking for gold. But you look at the lids of these boxes as you walk through and they're just gently pushed, just enough that you could get whatever's inside out of them again. You know, and just looking at it and feeling it, um, to me, you know, you can't say for sure, but it looks to me like it's a, it's a great place for storage. Um, and especially when you look at it, what happens during, you know, the 12,500 years ago, what happened during these catastrophes, uh, it would be extremely functional to have seeds when, you know, when it's when it's a time that we can go out and begin planting again. You, you know, it just makes sense to me. So we'll be going to the Assyrian or the Osiris shaft tomorrow. Uh, what what do you guys expect to, to find there? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know too much about it. I mean, I've, I've been reading up on it. I know Robert Temple's been down there, Olivia Temple, and I've been reading their research. But as far as I understand, much like, you know, in some ways, the Assyrian up in um, Abydos, it's, you know, some people claim it's like a reconstruction of 
tells the whole story of Osiris and the burial and all this kind of stuff. But I understand the sarcophagi are of, of equal magnitude to the Serapeum. So, uh, and the fact that it's buried deep in the ground, there's water there, there's even pillars there holding things up, does intrigue me. So until we get there, I can't really say too much about it, but that is going to be an interesting visit. Well, I'm excited to go there tomorrow, which that will be my first time, but I'm also, there's a certain amount of trepidation because I do suffer from vertigo, but I'm, I'm going to go for this, I'm going to go for this. But, uh, I mean, officially, it is a symbolic Osiris um, you know, tomb. Um, and what this really means is the fact that Osiris himself was said to have been murdered by his uh, evil brother, Set, um, and his body was placed in a, uh, a tomb or a coffin and it was sealed up and thrown into the water um, and then it was retrieved and the whole story of Osiris who is the dead god I mean that's what he is he's not just god of the dead he is the god that is dead uh, of which every pharaoh would become in death but <coughs> excuse me the, the the significance of the island is not simply the fact that it represents the, the tomb of Osiris but it also represents the primeval mound or the primeval um, island uh, which was said to have existed at the beginning of time and to have risen out of the primeval ocean that's what this also represents what the Assyrian represents at Abydos is what the Osiris shaft um, and as you said it's something that's that's so deep down into the plateau that the water table has risen up and created this mini lake around the deepest sarcophagus uh, and there's a lot of symbolism in that and uh, also I think what's important to point out is that the sarcophagus is so large that it could not have come through the vertical shaft that leads down to it uh, and that raises incredible questions of what is going on there um, and uh, the most likely explanation is that there is uh, other levels there which link with the surface somehow uh, possibly horizontal tunnels uh, that go away from there I mean this is something I know that Dr. Tahir Was was looking at uh, he was trying to investigate he was sent a, a little boy up one uh, small uh, you know a fissure in the rock to see what went up there nothing going I'm afraid but um, somewhere there I think is uh, some kind of um, sealed up entrance into a tunnel system that could unlock uh, the age-old mystery of the Hall of Records uh, and the evidence that we need for what we call the Egyptian elder culture who we believe existed not just in pre-dynastic times but much further back before the time of the cataclysm, so down to around 11,000 BC. I tend to agree with what Andrew is saying. Uh, we have to look at the dynamic design of where it's placed, you know, um, up not a little bit, almost halfway up the causeway up the um, middle pyramid. And the middle pyramid, uh, we believe, uh, based on Hakim's teaching, is the oldest pyramid and uh, it is built, you know, carved right out of the bedrock, the mound. And uh, I think where it's placed, the design of the shaft itself, the design of the box surrounded by water with, you know, the Romans came and destroyed that chamber, but, you know, it, what was there, what was it connected to? Uh, we've heard, you know, the possibility that it was connected to the Sphinx and, you know, if we could find out more, yeah, I do believe we would find, <laughs> we would discover or reveal many secrets that uh, people have been looking at, you know, the Hall of Records, yes, um, but just that design, what, what all is, is, is a part of that? I don't think that's something will be discovered tomorrow, but uh, the fact that it's been closed to the public for so long uh, that you couldn't even open the door with the right amount of bakshish and now suddenly we're allowed to go in. That's exciting in and of itself, so uh, hopefully we can take pictures and uh, share that with the public and uh, we'll let you all know. <laughs> I guess as a takeaway, what, what are your favorite sites here in Egypt? And uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, well, there's, there's, uh, there's about 10, uh, no, no, it's a stick, stick, stick with one or two. I think that there's, there's one, 
ones that grab my attention, which fascinate me and intrigue me the most, is the Assyrian in Abydos because of the megalithic nature and the potential antiquity of it. And the fact that it's got um, specific types of stonework like we see in Peru with the, the protrusions, we have a slight polygonal style with, with the, uh, and everything else there. And also the way that relates to the Valley Temple and the Sphinx Temple on the Giza Plateau. They, they both, all these places fascinate me. The whole Giza Plateau clearly is where it's at. You know, that's, you can't beat that really. Um, but the Valley Temple, for instance, is, is fascinating. It's almost identical, but slightly smaller chunks of stone as the Assyrian. There's, there are similarities there. There's the polygonal walls. There's the, the granite, the, the different types of rock. Um, you have the kind of water, it seems to have water in both of them, uh, naturally and originally. That, that's what it was like. You can see the water uh, marks on the wall in the, the Valley Temple. They both have keystone cuts. You can't see the keystone cuts which would have, would have had either wood or possibly metal or stone in them to link the stones together, which we find, it's a tradition we find all over the world, but they are at the Valley Temple and they are at the Assyrian and many other sites around Egypt. They're not in the Sphinx Temple though, interestingly. The Sphinx Temple seems to be a whole different thing to the Valley Temple, even though they're right next to each other and touching each other. Uh, probably more, uh, probably older, the Sphinx Temple, most likely. Um, but when you look at them and there's no, no real original inscriptions on them, they're just pure megalithomania in stone, just marking these particular parts of uh, Egypt. And they're kind of unique, but you do find uh, you know, evidence of that kind of quality of stone working, obviously the Serapium and uh, some of the sarcophagi, uh, various other pyramids, like uh, the Ben Pyramid and uh, the Red Pyramid of Dasha and so on. Um, but these ones really intrigue me. And there's Andrew. I think um, for me, uh, I'll highlight uh, two or three sites. Um, one old, as in one I've been to many times, which is the Giza Plateau itself. Um, and if you focus in on one place, it's got to be the inside of the Great Pyramid, uh, in particular the King's Chamber. Uh, I mean, to me, I think for the, the new age sort of alternative mysteries audience, I don't think you can have a better Mecca, basically, somewhere that is like the heart, the beating heart of this subject. Uh, not just because it's a, a beautiful place, it's a mystery as to exactly what was going on there, but the acoustics there are just extraordinary. I mean, you know, they are, um, they're, they're, they're almost otherworldly. Um, when somebody speaks, the voice is carried in such a way that it sounds like it's going off into the distance. So in darkness there, it just sounds like you're in a vast landscape, you know, another worldly landscape, which is, I don't know of anywhere else in the world that has that specific type of acoustics. So to know that specific geometry and mathematics may have gone into its design makes it even more appealing to, to my own research. So yeah, the King's Chamber uh, inside the Great Pyramid, but somewhere new, somewhere that I'd never been to before on the, you know, was on this tour, which was Aswan. I'd never been to Aswan before. What a wonderful place that is. Uh, and particularly when we went to Elephantine Island, I started to understand for the first time why the ancient Egyptians saw the granite, the, the red or pink granite that, that they get from Elephantine Island traditionally and brought back to cover various of the temples and the pyramids because it was quite clearly seen as a point of beginning, you know, an absolute sort of like point of foundation. Um, there's a power and energy, you know, Hugh himself feels that um, various quarries, not just in ancient Egypt but in other parts of the world, were sacred in their own right and it was important to take the rock from a certain location and to venerate it as almost divine in its own nature. And I think this is absolutely true. And this is what was going on at Elephantine Island. And you can see the life and vitality around it. The birds and, and the water, the plants, the greenery. And obviously if you then come back to what was then Lower Egypt, to here in the Menthite area, contrast is, is quite dramatic so I can understand why the ancient Egyptians now face the south 
as the direction of life because they would be thinking in terms of, of Aswan and Elephantine Island as the place of beginning, the, the place where the Nile, symbolically at least, begins. Uh, but the place which I really need to know a lot more about that's coming up bigger and bigger now is this site Helwan, uh, which uh, myself and um, uh, Hugh, oh sorry, Brennan, should we not mention that in this? Thank you, sir. Because obviously <laughs> you, you said about not saying anything. Uh, uh, maybe, well, maybe just to talk about it. Just yeah, I know, but I said you, scouted, you and I. Scouted went the area, doesn't necessarily mean. <laughs> yeah, <it's right. laughs> All right, we're going to have to edit this bit now anyway. All right, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just throw in something then. Start, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll be nebulous uh, then. For that. And the one other place which uh, has become important uh, to our research, and I think should get a mention now, is Helwan. Uh, this is uh, just to the east of the city of Memphis, on the other side of the River Nile. Uh, and all the indications are that ancient Egyptian civilization recognizes as the foundation point of its own culture and there is evidence of human activity and settlement there going back at least to 18,000 BC um, at a time when it was all greenery there was you know, beautiful trees and oasis and different animals uh, you know there including zebras and ostriches and all sorts of other creatures there but more importantly, there's evidence of extreme high culture right the way down and evidence of some of the earliest agriculture in the world occurring there um, around 11, 12,000 BC. But then there's a hiatus of, of occupation during the time of the so-called Younger Dryas when we know there was a cataclysm. And then about 8,000 BC, a culture starts a new settlement there who are directly linked with Gobekli Tepe in southeast Turkey. And I think that this is how a lot of this ancient wisdom passed from Gobekli Tepe into Egypt around that time. And from that point onwards, the settlement grew in the area of Helwan and expanded until they were using huge blocks of, of stone to create tombs uh, in the, you know, just the end of the pre-dynastic period, beginning of the dynastic period. Um, and a lot of the inspiration of Helwan goes on to become a portent at Giza and indeed the three pyramids are actually on an arc and if you find the circle of that um, it points straight towards Helwan. It's almost like the three pyramids of Giza honour Helwan as the place of beginning, the place of Zet Tepe. It's also uncertain the place of origin that's given in the Edfu building uh, texts that are found on the walls of the, uh, the Temple of, of Horus at Edfu in southern Egypt that talk about this place where it all began. Um, and this, I am certain now, was Helwan. So that's going to become a very important place in the future. Oh, when people ask me that question, I almost always say the place I'm at now. <laughs> um, Egypt is just amazing. But uh, the people that know me uh, know that uh, Dendera has a special place in my heart. Uh, just from when you enter the first gate and you look up and you see the underbelly of the scarab, which is the only place in Egypt that you'll see that. And Hakim would say that that meant you're entering a place that uh, holds all the secrets, and in my opinion, it does. And they lie within the structure itself, the, 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 the architecture of the structure. And on the ceilings, um, as you move from one part of the temple to the next i mean just you, you know you're, you're moving up you're springing up you're spiraling up to the second floor and you're falling down to uh, the first floor on the winter side of the cycle uh, the ceilings uh, the symbolism is just amazing and uh, you know since i've lived here in egypt i've been here 10 years my first trip was in 2005 when i first came that first that ceiling when you enter dendera the first tipa style hall was completely black you couldn't see anything and now you know layer upon layer they've cleaned it until now the entire almost the entire ceiling is totally cleaned and, and it just looks amazing and the symbolism within it tells a story that is almost unbelievable um, and so for me I, I this is where my interest lies is deciphering uh, you know the, the, the cycles and the cycles within the cycles 
um, that are, are painted on these walls. Every, every, every chamber you enter, they're depicted in the um, iconography and the symbolism. And aside from that, you know, it's, it's everywhere that you go. Each, each area holds a, a tone or a, 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 an archetype of a, a whole holographic image of how we relate or interact with this reality. I mean, this, the structures, the temples, everything in Egypt is, is, it's amazing how it's an overlay upon an overlay upon an overlay of the same story. And it, it, in my opinion, if you can just de decipher the formula, you're going to understand almost every small aspect of the whole. All right. So how can we find more research and information from you guys? Oh, well, from me, uh, yeah, it's from the uh, uh, megalithomania. It's kind of spelled like that without the C on the end. Yeah. <laughs> and um, at megalithomania.co.uk, and just search for me, Hugh Newman, and you'll find plenty of mostly nice things about me online. Excellent. Andrew? Uh, yes, um, andrewcollins.com, just as simple as that. Uh, great website, hundreds of articles on there spanning two decades now. Um, and um, my new book is out called The Cygnus Key, uh, the subtitle The Denisovan, the, the Denisovan Legacy, the Vecchi Tepe and the Birth of Egypt. So um, it's almost like my Opus Magnus or whatever you call it. Uh, and that's, that's out now and I'd, I'd like... Uh, you know, like you'll see that. Um, and that's about it, really. So. Oh, and me? <laughs> of course, you can find um, all of the things, all our events and activities um, on hematology.com. Also, I'm launching a new website, which is harrisrising.com. And uh, we're going to be continuing with more interviews on site with our speakers and um, documentaries, webinars. Uh, just. Stay tuned to uh, um, all of our websites for up upcoming tours, events, and um, new material that's being released as we go. Excellent. Well, this concludes the first Giza Direct interview series. I <laughs> hope to be many more. Thank you very much. From Giza. And now the dance. <laughs> <laughs>